Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. We are excited to have you with us today and appreciate you dedicating this time this morning to better understand the new, this new legislation and its implication on your business and for your supply chain as well. Uh, today's webinar is the first in the series of two addressing the modern slavery legislation. Uh, this morning, we'll give you a brief overview of the act and focus on the relevant tests to determine which entities are captured by the act and are required to report. Uh, the next webinar will be held on Thursday, May 16th at 11 a.m. And during that webinar, we will focus on the reporting requirements themselves and will aim to provide you with some practical suggestions on the steps your organization can take to prepare the report that is compliant with the uh, disclosure requirements under the act. Before uh, we begin, I would like to uh, briefly introduce my co-presenter, Alex Goss. Alex is a corporate lawyer at McGinnis Cooper and her practice includes advising on ESG matters. Um, my name is Basha Georgianowska. I'm a partner in the Halifax office and advise public and private companies on corporate and securities matters, as well as ESG, including uh, Modern Slavery Act compliance. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to encourage everyone to use the question box function in, in, in the program in case you have any questions and we'll address those at the end of uh, the presentations as we have set aside some time uh, for your questions. So with that, we'll, we'll get started on the introduction to the act. Um, so, um, on January 1st, 2024, this year, uh, the Federal Fighting Against Forced Labor and Child Labor in Supply Chains Act took effect. It's a mouthful. The name of the act is a mouthful. So, therefore, it is often referred to as Bill S-211 or Modern Slavery Act or simply as the MSA. This act serves as a transparency tool to aid the fight against modern slavery. It aims to eradicate forced labor and child labor from Canadian supply chains. It imposes annual uh, reporting obligations on organizations that meet the criteria set out in the Act. Um, and the first report, as you probably all know, has to be submitted by the end of this month. In December of last year, Public Safety Canada launched a new website and released guidelines clarifying um, the reporting obligations and clarifying who is required to report under the Act and, and how the report should be uh, submitted. Those guidelines uh, have been updated in March, uh, on March 7th of this year. Uh, and essentially, uh, they are um, providing additional guidance and clarifications on, on what is an ent considered an entity and what entities have reporting obligations. So as noted earlier, this session is designed to help you get a basic understanding of the MSA, consider whether you may have reporting obligations under the Act, and that you are aware of the ramifications of uh, consequences of non-compliance. And there's some severe penalties under this Act in those cases. Um, the MSA, um, once it was introduced, it also amended another existing piece of legislation, the Canadian Customs Tariffs, to prohibit importation of goods mined, manufactured, or produced wholly or in part by child labor or forced labor. Um, with forced labor was already prohibited under the Customs Tariffs Act, but it added the child labor component. So, when we refer to modern uh, slavery, we're speaking, essentially speaking, about forced labor and child labor. So the two key definitions that I think we need to look at when we're speaking about those topics is what are what is forced labor and forced labor is essentially the type of work that is uh, provided involuntarily or under a threat. And child labor is defined as work that is mentally, physically, socially or morally dangerous for children or interferes with their right to education. Um, so those are uh, something that we need to keep in mind when we're assessing what, whether you know, uh, forced labor or child labor is involved. Um, 
while the present presence of forced labor and child labor in Canada uh, lower than in other parts of the world, um, many North American, including Canadian companies, profit from, from those activities uh, through their supply chains. Um, and these are big issues that the, uh, the new Canadian legislation, the MSA, is trying to address, even if it's done indirectly through the reporting obligations. So that's in essence is a, a brief overview of what the, this new act is and what it aims to uh, to accomplish. So as we move to um, the next slide, um, you know, are you a reporting entity? What organization? We have to ask ourselves: What are what organizations have reporting obligations? Is your organization a reporting entity? Yes, no, maybe. Um, there are several tests under the Act that need to be considered depending on the organization that you are. Um, and over the next few slides, we will go over in detail uh, through those tests and help you understand um, uh, the uh, reporting obligations under the Act. It's a sensitive topic um, for many organizations uh, because it poses some risks to the business, including it, reputational risks. So it really needs a careful consideration, a careful approach. It does require um, some or much due diligence within your organization, perhaps a robust team of multidisciplinary team, team within your organization um, to uh, do the necessary uh, work to determine whether you um, need to comply with the requirements of the Act. And it often also involves involvement of uh, professional advisors as the analysis, especially for the larger entities, can be quite uh, complex. Uh, the Act addresses both governmental institutions and private entities. Um, we will touch base briefly in this presentation on governmental entities. Um, however, most of this, um, this presentation will be focused on private, private businesses. So uh, reporting formula, what is the reporting uh, formula for an entity? So there's a definition of entity in the act and there's also certain targeted activities that the act addresses. And if you meet the definition of the entity, and then that entity does the uh, activities that are enumerated as activities that are targeted by the Act, then you have to file a report with, with the government and uh, file also on, uh, on your website in a prominent place. And in some circumstances, for you have to also send it to your, your shareholders, but we'll get into that later. Uh, it is pretty, as noted earlier, it is pretty simple in some cases to determine whether you are entity, but uh, as we have um, been assisting our clients, uh, it is often a quite a complex task and it does take uh, quite a bit of time to determine whether your entity, when you look at it as a group, so it's not just, you know, especially for larger entities when you have many subsidiaries to determine whether you meet, we meet those tests. And once you, um, once you uh, determine that you are an entity, then you have to look at the uh, activities that are uh, enumerated, and those include producing, selling, distributing goods in Canada, but also it's important to note that also it captures um, doing it elsewhere, not just in Canada. So that is a very important um, factor to consider. Importing goods to Canada or directly or indirectly controlling a business that is involved in those activities, such as producing, selling, distributing goods, or importing goods to Canada. Um, the recent update to the guidelines um, has uh, uh, provided some clarification uh, on, on, on that test for the targeted activities. However, it is by excluding distributing and selling um, uh, components of the definition, but the act still refers to all of those activities. Uh, so that's just something that to, to keep in mind when, when assessing what are the target activities. So um, in the next slide, we'll look at, at what is considered an entity under the act. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we'll focus on, um, on the private um, uh, a sector uh, entities, but just wanted to mention that the federal institutions and departments, federal crown corporations and wholly owned subsidiaries, 
are all caught by the Act. Uh, the updated guidelines uh, have recently um, uh, clarified that provincial government institutions and municipal government institutions are excluded uh, from the requirement to, uh, to report, um, but um, it's certainly something that those organizations also have to carefully consider to make sure that the, whether the act applies to them or not. So in terms of the uh, private businesses, um, private sector entities, it captures an entity and any of its subsidiaries and includes all sorts of um, legal um, uh, entities such as corporations, trusts, partnerships, uh, or other um, organizations that, um, so it's a wide, uh, wide form of, of business enterprises that is captured. And as long as that, um, the, the uh, definition of entity um, is met and that the, the entity carries on remunerated activities, then it will be required to, um, uh, to file a report. So you really, really do need to look at your organization as a whole, as an entire group, and do the analysis to um, to make sure that whether, you know, to confirm whether you meet that definition or, or you don't. Um, and as a result, do not have to uh, report. So um, on the next slide, um, we have a little bit more information how you work through the definition of, of entity. So if you're a company that is listed on the stock exchange in Canada, you are considered an entity and don't have to go any further in terms of whether you meet the, um, the requirements of that definition. However, if you are a private company, you have to look at two thresholds and satisfy them both. So you have to have Canadian connection threshold and you also have to meet the uh, size threshold. The uh, Canadian uh, connection threshold, um, essentially it means that you have a place of business in Canada or do business in Canada, or uh, the company or organization has assets in Canada. Uh, the size threshold is a little bit uh, more um, detailed. Um, so we'll get, uh, we'll provide a lot more information on that in the subsequent slides, but um, we'll discuss each of those thresholds in turn to provide further information as um, as both tests are quite quite can be quite complex when you're you're determining whether you meet those uh, thresholds or, or or not. So moving to the uh, um, Canadian connection threshold. Um, you essentially, if you're not a listed company, you need to review this, this part of the test and uh, determine whether you need any, satisfy any one of those three um, conditions. So um, the guidelines indicate that you can determine this based on CRA criteria for tax purposes or on ordinary sense of the words but it does, the guidelines provide, do provide clarification. So in terms of a play, if you have a place of business in Canada, um, that would mean whether the business owns, rents, or simply has premises that are available to, to your business or has facilities used to carry on business. Uh, this could be just exclusive or non-exclusive purpose for your business, as long as that is available. Um, where goods are produced, sold, distributed, where you have employees, where deliveries are made, payments, purchases or contracts are made, where assets um, are acquired or whether um, you have assets, inventories or bank accounts located in, in Canada. Those are all um, criteria for a place of business in Canada. The uh, second criteria is whether you do business in Canada. This one does not require a place of business uh, located within Canada, but you have to look at the CA array criteria, um, whether you, you meet that um, condition. And you would look at you know, tax filings for your uh, organizations and such to um, determine whether you do business in Canada. Um, and finally, the last, um, last step is if you have assets in Canada and that captures any property that may be owned by any person or business, uh, and it includes intangibles, such as goodwill, for example. So again, these are pretty broad. They're 
uh, you know, are determined to capture a lot of activities. Um, so if you meet any one of those three, then you are um, considered to have met the uh, first step of the um, uh, entity meeting, the Canadian connection. And um, the second part is the, um, the, the size threshold that needs to be met before you are uh, determined uh, uh, an entity. And uh, I will turn over to Alex to discuss that in detail, and as well as the subsequent um, um, reporting requirements uh, and those enumerated activities that I um, raised uh, initially during this presentation. So over to you, Alex. Thank you, Baja. So now I'm going to talk about the second threshold um, that an entity must meet in order to be considered an entity under the Act. And so this is the size threshold. So in addition to the Canadian um, connection that Baja just spoke about, uh, to be considered an entity under the Act, you must also meet the size threshold. Mm -hmm. So you meet the size threshold if, based on your consolidated financial statements, you satisfy at least two of these three conditions on the slide. Um, and that's for at least one of your two most recent financial years. And so the first um, size threshold test would be you have at least 20 million um, in assets. And the guidelines clarify that uh, assets refers to gross, not net assets. And then um, the second would, test would be you have generated at least $40 million in revenue. And then the third is you have employed an average of at least 250 employees. And um, so the, the guidelines also state that you should base this calculation on the average number of your employees employed over the financial year and to ex exclude independent contractors. Um, further, the guidelines clarify that these calculations should be made in Canadian dollars and based on your global, so not just Canadian uh, assets, revenue, and employees. So the Act uh, requires these thre size thresholds uh, mentioned on the previous slide to be based on your consolidated financial statements. So the, the updated guidelines provided welcomed clarification on how to assess the parents and subsidiaries um, for this purpose. So the subsidiaries are to determine whether they are an entity under this test entirely independently of their parents and based on their own financial statements. So um, looking at solely their own financial statements, not including their parents, if they don't meet this entity test, then they do not have a reporting obligation full stop. And with respect to the parents, they are to determine whether they're an entity based on their consolidated financial statements. So this includes their subsidiaries' financial statements. Uh, we also note that the definition of entity includes those headquartered and operating in any country or jurisdiction, so not just Canada. Um, so this means that the Act can apply to organizations neither owned nor controlled by a Canadian entity that otherwise might meet the entity test. So that's important to, to consider. And so if you've determined that you're an entity under the, the Canadian threshold test and the size threshold test, um, even if you are an entity within the meaning of the Act, you're only under an obligation to report if you carry on one or more of the targeted activities described under the Act. So, as mentioned, uh, you need to be engaged in one or more of these activities. So, the Act describes the activities under sort of three um, categories. The first being producing, selling, or distributing goods in Canada or elsewhere. And so the Act defines the production of goods to include the manufacturing, growing, and extracting, and processing of goods. Um, and further, that goods are referred to goods that are subject to trade and commerce and are meant to be understood in their, the ordinary sense of the word. Um, further, they do capture marketing and administrative financial and software services. Um, I think Baja also mentioned that there have been questions about how these updated guidelines um, 
can remove selling and distributing from the guidelines and yet selling and distributing still remains in the act. And so it's important to note that the act does still include selling and distributing. And since the act is the law and, and the guidelines aren't, um, you should comply with the act. And um, hopefully there'll be further clarification on you know, why selling and distributing was removed from the guidelines. But for now, um, it remains in the act and, and the act is the law. So, and then the, so that's the producing, selling or distributing goods. The second category would be importing into Canada goods produced outside of Canada. So um, the guidelines provide further clarity on who is the importer of goods. Uh, they state, the guidelines state that it's, it's the entity that's responsible for accounting for the imported goods under the Customs, uh, Canadian Customs Act. So for the purposes of the act, um, an entity wouldn't be considered importing goods if the purchased goods uh, produced outside of Canada from a third party, and that third party was already the importer of record for those goods. And then the last category um, is controlling directly or indirectly an entity that is engaged in either producing, selling, or distributing goods in Canada or elsewhere, or in importing into Canada goods pr produced outside of Canada. So even if um, the entity was not uh, directly engaged in the first two categories uh, by controlling an entity they may be captured under the act so under the act control includes both direct and indirect control um, and it is intended to extend down the entity's organizational chain so as an example if the reporting entity controls a business that controls another business both businesses are captured under this definition of control And the, the guidelines do provide further guidance on determining control. Um, and they state that um, applicable accounting standards can be used to determine this and um, that it's intended to be uh, broad and interpreted in its substance over form. So it could include situations which an entity exercises joint control of an operation, for example. So the act, um, or the guidelines, sorry, do provide further clarification on um, what's included in activities under the act. So the act doesn't set a minimum value of goods that you must produce, sell, or import to be captured by the act. But the guidelines do state that the act should be understood to exclude very minor dealings. So there, however, there's no further clarification about this exception. Minor is not defined under the act or guidelines, and the guidelines do not say how to determine what is minor. So, you know, for example, the guidelines do not actually state to use materiality. Um, uh, there is a de minimis standard um, in law, it, it, which is usually 2%, less than 2%. Um, however, as mentioned, there is really no further guidance or definition of what is meant to be minor. Um, so the, the, because of that, the scope of this exception could be very narrow. Um, so there's no further guidance on this, but the, whether the dealings are considered minor should be determined by the reporting entity and what they determine to be minor in relation to their overall business. We, we have reached out to Public Safety Canada via email and, and the phone on this issue and haven't heard back. Um, it, our hunches, they likely don't know and, and are being asked this. Um, we'll hopefully be provided with greater clarity soon though, and this approach is likely to develop over the years um, as reports roll out. So now I'm going to speak about the non-compliance risks um, associated with the Act. So the Act does hold reporting entities accountable for their reporting obligations through stat statutory non-compliance measures. And these include serious consequences and penalties for both the reporting entity and also its directors and officers personally. So what are actually are these non-compliance penalties? So the first is there's entity liability. So the entity that fails to comply or knowingly misleads or files a false report um, 
which is, would be a report that includes false statements, uh, they're exposed to a conviction for a summary offense and a fine up to $250,000. And we also note that there is reputational damage con to consider as well if you are found to be in non-compliance or um, in particular you are found to file a false report or misleading report that could have serious um, reputational damages associated with it. Um, as well as uh, entities should be careful when making forward-looking statements in these reports. So the guidelines state that entities are expected to provide honest responses um, and to describe concrete actions that they have taken to address um, modern slavery and, and not to include these purely aspirational statements. So that so as mentioned, entity liability is, is one uh, non-compliance penalty. And another is a notable one is personal liability for the, the directors and officers. So they're exposed to personal liability. This is regardless of whether they or the entity have been prosecuted or convicted of a summary offense. Um, and this is just for, as you see on the slide, directing, authorizing, assenting to um, any um, report that is in non-compliance. And it's worth noting that these are also separate penalties under the Act. So each instance of failure to comply with the requirement of the Act can result in a separate penalty. So as noted on the slides, this could be failure to file the report altogether, or it could be uh, the failure to have the report approved as required under the Act. Um, uh, there is also um, requirement of who's signing the Act, or sorry, the report. And um, as Baja mentioned, there's um, a requirement for certain entities to send the report along to the shareholders. So um, any of these instances of non-compliance um, with requirements under the Act could result in their own separate penalties. So as you can imagine, um, that could add up and result in quite serious, um, expensive fines um, or penalties and penalties. So um, we also do note though that the government has made public statements uh, that they're going to be focusing on education at this first filing period um, and focusing on really bringing entities into compliance. So, um, but entities should be aware that these are, these are the non-compliance penalties that exist um, and are available to government under the act. So lastly, um, with respect to enforcement of the act, uh, it does give the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness new enforcement powers. And as noted on the slide, these include um, powers to search, inspect, and seize documents and evidence. So these are, these are broad enforcement powers. And I believe that's, that's all we have for this part one of the webinar today. Um, and as Baja mentioned, we welcome and encourage questions in the, in the chat function of the webinar. If there are no questions, we uh, would like to thank everyone for participating this morning, for joining us uh, to uh, learn about this, this new legislation. And we uh, invite you to uh, join us again in two days' time to, uh, to talk about the other aspects of, of, of preparing the report if you are a reporting entity. Um, so thanks again, and uh, if you have any questions or any uh, concerns that relate to your, or specific questions that are, um, are in relation to your uh, particular entity, please feel free to reach out to Alex or myself uh, by email.